Welcome uh, to uh, the first of the award session uh, talks for uh, the 2015 meeting. Uh, ASLO has a series of awards and they're, they're, they've got a bunch of different um, objectives. Some are early career awards designed to honor our friends and colleagues who've just got their careers going and who could benefit from the recognition that their work is starting to transform how we think. Some are very specifically about applied issues, the Ruth Patrick Award, some are educational, the Ramon Margalev Award, which is particularly relevant this year, and, and, and some are more uh, career oriented, such as the AC Redfield uh, Career Achievement Award, which is today's, today's award. Just a sec. I'm so smooth. Uh, all right, so today's award is the, the AC Redfield Award, and it's uh, going to be presented to uh, David W. Schindler. Dave was born in the 1940 in the center of North America in, in near Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Uh, he, he did his, his undergrad degree at North Dakota State and graduated in 1962 and published his first science paper the year later. Anyway, uh, he, he then uh, did his PhD at Oxford as part of, part of a Rhodes Scholar, and, and Dave was um, uh, first started with uh, Nikolai Tin, Tinbergen and then moved to work with uh, Charles Elton shortly thereafter and, and did his degree, finished in 1966, then came back to Canada, or came to Canada and worked at Trent University for a couple of years. He was then poached or taken from the university by Jack Valentine, who was influenced by research that was done on whole lakes by Arthur Hasler in the States. And, the idea was that in order to address the issues in society that were related to water, we needed to do things at the appropriate scale, and that was the scale of the entire ecosystem. So Jack Valentine, also known as Johnny Biosphere, uh, put together a program to bring the world's best aquatic scientists to a remote area of, of western Ontario and Canada, and he chose David to be the leader, and from there they, they staffed up. David was well picked. I mean, the work has been utterly transformative in any way that you choose to define that, whether it's dealt with the causes of eutrophication, which was the preeminent environmental aquatic issue in the 60s and 70s, and which I'll talk about today, or acid rain and the effects on aquatic ecosystems through the 1980s, at the cutting edge of understanding climate effects on ecosystems, aerial contaminants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really hard to pick anybody uh, who's been more transformative on, on freshwater science. Dave's iconic in any way that you choose to define it, and one of the few scientists I would say that could be described reasonably as legendary. Uh, anybody who knows Dave has a Dave story. Mine often start with, well, Peter, I'm afraid you're not right about this, but uh, he's, he's, uh, he's really been uh, capable of, of well, he does, he does the, a really important thing. What he does is he's unflinching in bringing fundam fundamental science to public policy. He's a champion of First Nations issues. And his research has been recognized on any number of different levels, from ASLO with the Hutchinson Award, through the Ruth Patrick Award, and today the Redfield Award. He was the inaugural winner of the Stockholm Water Prize. And he has been, in, in, for most of my life, one of my scientific heroes. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dave uh, to come up to the stage and receive the AC uh, Redfield Award for, uh, for uh, career achievements and listen to his talk. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for postponing lunch to come and, and hear me today. Uh, it seems uh, like 52 years, which is the time since I published my first paper, has gone awfully fast. Uh, in some ways, I regret being done when I hear all the changes going on that I'd have to cope with glad I'm not having to cope with them. That's all I can say. I want to think about science, not all the impact factors and stuff I have to do. Anyhow, uh, when I was asked to choose a topic for today, I chose one that uh, has been arousing my ire for the last little while, and I thought I would uh, relate it to some past work. And uh, 
The title is given here. Uh, it's a takeoff on the shootout at the OK Corral. Of course, since I'm Canadian and we're in Europe, those would be water pistols, not NRA approved uh, pistols. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to Val Smith, whom I've known since he was a young graduate student and I wasn't much older and we've collaborated on a number of related issues over the years. One of the most influential papers for me was Redfield's 1958 paper. That's not the first paper where he recognized uh, the Redfield ratio, but it's a very subtle paper in that it was really the first paper, paper to describe how biology changed the nature of the oceans. You have to put that in perspective. In that day, it was Selene's ocean, not the kinetic ocean that we've come to accept today. It was regarded as a, a huge soup that was in uh, thermodynamic equilibrium with the Earth's geology, and therefore that had to dictate what the biology did. Remember, this paper was, was 13 years before Wally Broker's classic kinetic paper on the oceans in science, which got the world thinking that maybe biology had something to do with the ocean after all. So uh, I found this a very interesting and very clearly written paper, and it's one you should actually read, something that seems out of fashion these days. People look at the impact factor, not whether someone actually reads your paper or not. And that's one index that some electronic genius needs, should have some index of whether people read your work. So since most of this happened before you were born, most of you, I th thought I'd go back and this was all work done at the experimental lakes. I'm talking only about eutrophication. So it's the six lakes uh, in pale green here that this work was done on. And we had a strange topic to start with. We were just getting the lakes identified and a road built in a, in a laboratory, which was just a few trailers. And this dispute uh, was arising in the St. Lawrence Great Lakes. The International Joint Commission, influenced by people like uh, Richard Vollenweider and Jack Valentine, was proposing that the US and Canada should regulate phosphorus. The soap and detergent industry put together a volume shown here of a bunch of little papers uh, uh, on small bottles and mesocosms that proved that carbon was limiting it. And uh, they criticized the IJC for this, uh, this uh, uh, very narrow view of what was needed to be done to control uh, carbon. Well, we had just finished our initial assays at the experimental lakes. We found that the lakes had such low dissolved inorganic carbon that we needed to develop some new methods to measure it. Uh, before our studies, most of them were done by just simple titration. And this lake, number 227, had lower carbon content than any lake that had ever been measured at that time. So we thought it would be interesting to add phosphorus and nitrogen to that lake. If it turns eutrophic, it will knock the uh, carbon theory right out of the water. It was opposed by about half of my colleagues who accused us of actually confusing the eutrophication issue even more. But the bottom slide here shows you what happened when we added phosphorus and nitrogen, which we did uh, for up and until uh, uh, 1988. Then we cut off the nitrogen, which I'll get to in a few minutes. And the reason that those uh, little bottles and mesocosms were giving us uh, inappropriate predictions was that they were cutting off lakes from the atmosphere or the water from the atmosphere. And the top slide shows what happened in this lake. This, uh, the uh, algae taking up the phosphorus and nitrogen drew the CO2 to several orders of magnitude below atmospheric equilibrium. So slowly over time, phosphorus or carbon invaded the lake. It took 14 years uh, 
for it to come to a new steady state. And the bottom slide shows you what we all know happens in lakes now, that they started out well above equilibrium and they barely dropped atmospheric equilibrium. Incidentally, this is a 1970 slide if you're puzzled why the atmospheric equilibrium is so low. And uh, so, so much for the performance of bottles on, car on carbon. We did bottle bioassays in this lake too after adding carbon and nitrogen to one side and carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus to the other, lo and behold, the bottles told us that the uh, north side of the lake was nitrogen limited throughout, uh, even though on the bottom we knew that adding nitrogen without phosphorus was doing nothing to the lake. And over the years, some people like to say, oh, you guys just worked on a couple of little lakes in a bubble. We actually have 79 lake years of fertilization data. And we did as much work on nitrogen or on nitrogen and phosphorus together as we did on phosphorus. And we did it both going upscale, adding nutrients, and downscale, removing the nutrients and studying the recovery of the lakes. So I don't think anybody else can match this amount of data uh, for experiments on whole ecosystems. And uh, we found, as everybody says from their mesocosms, you get a much faster response by adding lots of nitrogen with the carbon, or with the, the phosphorus, uh, if you're producing algal blooms. If you add a nitrogen deficient dose, you get a lot of blue-greens and you get a slower response, but if you do it long enough, you get to, to the same uh, uh, chlorophyll or algal level. Adding phosphorus alone slows the response down even more, and adding nitrogen without phosphorus did absolutely nothing. And if you do make the deletions, if I consider all of the, the lakes that were studied there, when you delete the nutrients, the algae track the phosphorus. The nitrogen either accumulates in the lake as nitri uh, nitrate or it's denitrified, tending uh, to denitrify if it's warm, a warm, shallow lake. And if you reduce nitrogen alone, based on two experiments, nothing happens. And we fiddled around with mesocosms too. These are 10 meter diameter mesocosms you can get some of those features, certainly not the ecosystem properties like the over a decade it took to come to new phosphorus and nitrogen equilibria, but you could reproduce the right movement of the algal succession and things in these. But this experiment that I show here was after three years of just fiddling with scaling these things, so they do the same thing as the lakes we were adding to. And yet today, I see nobody scaling their mesocosm experiments. They go out and throw in a bunch of bags and, and assume they're simulating the lake they're in. It's complete nonsense. So in summary, I'd say throw the bottles away. To a limnologist, the well-known acronym BS ought to mean bottle studies. And mesocosms, if you're going to use them, be very careful about what you're using them for. Well, they cut off our funds. They told us we'd solve the eutrophication problem. So after the 1970s, except for one lake, we were forced to go work on anything else. And some time went by. And lo and behold, after 2000, a phoenix arised from the ashes, the nitrogen control theory. This is after we had uh, uh, controlled phosphorus in the Great Lakes, and the Europeans had done it in a, a lot of the large alpine uh, lakes of Europe and so on. And these three papers incredibly claimed that uh, phosphorus control wasn't working. And uh, in particular, the third paper here, I'll come back to with respect to the Great Lake. It claims that the Great Lakes haven't recovered because we didn't control nitrogen. So, I really don't think the phosphorus paradigm is eroding if you look at the data. That list on the left are lakes that have recovered from control of phosphorus. And I point out one in yellow here at the bottom because it's not a lake. 
it's the only whole estuary study that's, uh, that's been studied, and phosphorus is the reason it controlled. There are no examples at the ecosystem level. There's lots of hand-waving. So my conclusion, as put out in this 2012 paper, is that the phosphorus paradigm, based on a few small lakes in a bubble, has increased in strength, not decreased. And others uh, doing real lakes, not lakes in a bubble, like Lake Washington, in the case of Tommy Edmondson, and, uh, uh, and Eugene Welsh, in the case of Moses Lake, came to very similar conclusions. What's missing from a lot of the critics of phosphorus control is that time after time you say, oh, well, phosphorus is coming back from the sediments. We can't do anything about phosphorus. Therefore, we have to control nitrogen. Well, if you look at those lakes that are recovered, most of them didn't recover very quickly. They took from several years to a few decades. And what happens, which is classically shown by this early paper of Ingemar Algren's, is that phosphorus from sediments slowly runs down after you uh, quit loading, quit the external loading of the phosphorus. Slowly it gets buried or washed out, and you come eventually to a new steady state. And this, if you look at the data for these lakes, and if you look at my 2012 paper, you'll see the references for all of the lakes in that table is what happens. Now, with respect to the Great Lakes needing nitrogen control, these are the actual data. This is phosphorus in, the, in all five of the Great Lakes. This paper, if you want to look for yourself, came out today in LNO. Uh, uh, Alice Dove from Canada Center for Inland Waters and Steve Chapra from the U.S. who's been one of the long-term participants see a very nice recovery of phosphorus. The dotted lines are the uh, International Association for Great Lakes Research's guidelines which they set in 1978 and you can see that in every case the guidelines have been reached or exceeded in terms of recovery. So a good phosphorus success story. And these are the chlorophyll data. So chlorophyll is recovered too. Remember, two other things have happened to the Great Lakes. We've turned it into a, a fish and aquatic invertebrate zoo. Uh, typically, two species take hold of the new introductions per year for that whole period I'm talking about. And one of them, zebra mussels, has uh, shunted where the phosphorus in the system go, goes. So in view of all of that, I think this is a pretty remarkable record. I think this is a key paper that people should read. It's written as though it's a terrestrial paper. In fact, the example they use of proximate versus ultimate limiting nutrients are taken from Lake 227. Proximate limiting nutrients are what you measure with a little bottle or a mesocosm. Today, nitrogen is limiting. Ultimate nutrients are the ones you have to wind down to change the ecosystem to a different state. And I'd like, to, like you to do a little thought experiment. Lake 227 has had nothing but phosphorus going into it for the last 23 years. If you were to send a team of bottle bioassayers in there today, they'd say, aha, the lake is nitrogen limited, which is typically what the state that takes place in the middle of the summer. They'd say, that means you have to control nitrogen. Well, there's no nitrogen going in except the little that falls in rainfall. It's absolutely the reverse of the conclusion that should be made. So is some very twisted logic being used by certain members of this society. Uh, we seem to have got it with respect to carbon, why carbon bioassays didn't tell us what was happening in the lakes correctly. We've had silica papers showing that silica is limited, and I don't see anyone running around 
saying to bring diatoms back to the Great Lakes, we need to limit silica, then why do we get our conclusions and our logic upside down for nitrogen? Culturally eutrophic lakes are approximately nitrogen limited because they're over, over fertilized with phosphorus, period. Now this is a paper of ours uh, on Lake 227 that we put out a few years ago. Uh, I've put a couple of updates on it. We concluded that reducing nitrogen did nothing to standing crop, except perhaps stabilize it a little bit. Uh, we showed that what happened was to compensate heterocyst production and, and nitrogen fixation went up. I've added one line since that paper. Uh, this is now 222 is what it should read uh, in measured last in 2001. And uh, critics have said, oh, look at your nitrogens going down. Uh, it'll eventually limit production. Well, what we have found is going down is the dissolved organic nitrogen pool. It isn't, as they say, denitrification. Denitrification is unmeasurable. There's never measurable nitrate in the lake naturally. It's getting so much phosphorus that algae grab every molecule as it's produced. And uh, here again, sorry, 224 should have been the number. Back when we were fertilizing with, uh, with N and P, uh, we were getting plenty of nitrogen. Now we're getting the same amount of nitrogen without adding the fertilizer. And of course the lake is a, a sea of blue-greens. Another common thing that's put in all of these nitrophile papers is, oh well, heterocysts and nitrogen fixation only produce a 40% or something of the annual nitrogen requirements of the phytoplankton. Well, huh, why is that something that dismisses it? Look at all the other sources of nitrogen. Here are the figures. These are put together by Igor Lehner, a, a postdoc in Sherry Schiff's lab for Lake 227 in 2011. This is the highest nitrogen fixation we've ever had, 52%. But we have nitrogen returning from the sediments. We have a little bit coming in in precipitation, some coming in in runoff. When you add them all up, we have well over red field numbers of N to P going into the lake. End of story. So there are some lessons from the experimental lakes area. Short-term nitrogen limitation does not mean that nitrogen must be controlled. It means the lake's been over-fertilized with phosphorus. Control what needs controlling. BS tell us nothing about long-term processes that correct these deficiencies. Mesocosms can tell us some of the features, but not really that many. We could end up with a society with a very bad reputation if we do what the EU and the US EPA and the New Zealand government and others are doing, and that is blanket controls on nitrogen. People are going to be very angry if they find out down the road that they control, did this expensive nitrogen control in sewage for nothing. And I'm not saying that nitrogen doesn't need to, to be controlled. We have a huge problem with atmospheric nitrogen. Not so much with eutrophication, but for soil acidification and acidification of freshwater and so on. If you look at the relative figures here of, of controlling phosphorus alone to controlling P and N, and then you think of all of the other problems we have out there that need treatment as well. I think uh, it's pretty obvious that we need to do a few more ecosystem experiments, particularly uh, in the estuarine environment, before we make these blanket recommendations. And uh, I think if Redfield were here today, he would tell us this whole nitrogen theory is a house of cards. On closer inspection, that wasn't the phoenix that was rising from the, the ashes, it was Icarus. And once exposed to, uh, to the sun, uh, the wax started to melt in his feathers. And I think that Emperor Nitrogen uh, needs a lot more clothes than he's currently wearing before we start making these blanket uh, uh, 
legislations and policies uh, for controlling eutrophication in lakes and estuaries. So what I'm going to propose is a shootout like the ones we had for phosphorus that solved some problems and a few years later uh, for phosphorus versus nitrogen. We should only have ecosystem scale experiments or case histories presented. We should ban bottles or mesocosms or any of the, the absurd nutrient ratio things that are done. Of course P and N are correlated all the time. The, uh, they're both mostly in the algae in most of these systems. We should have some long papers, not 10 minutes, and at least 20 minutes of debate afterward. And we should treat lakes first because we have lots of examples. It'd give the coastal water people a little time to get some real ecosystem data. And any hands that don't have a laser pointer for pointing at real data ought to be tied so they can't be waved. Thank you. So after this great talk, by Dave Schindler on uh, whole ecosystems and the value of whole ecosystems. We switch uh, gears.